so usually I make a, I go with the trial and error procedure. So let's see. But in this case, I make a cut and paste from my website, and therefore it's easy. But let's uh, let's forget about my uh, pre-prepared file. Let's try to uh, to use this trial and error procedure. Okay. So let's decide a name for the matrix. The name could be <coughs> River Flow Two, for instance. For sure, it, it's not. Uh, the same name that I used uh, on the website in the suggested R file, but it doesn't matter for now. And uh, the instruction is array. The function array wants as first argument the vector of the data, which is river flow. Remember, river flow, not river flow one, because river flow one is the order vector. We have to keep now. We have to take the vector in chronological order, not the vector in descending order. So it's river flow. And then the second argument is the dimension of the matrix. The dimension is a vector, because we need to give two dimensions. This is a 2D matrix. We can easily use the five 3D, 4D matrices. Just keep into account that if you increase the dimension of a matrix, you may run out of memory of the PC because it's very easy to run out of uh, array and memory if you define a matrix with multiple dimensions. And in most of the cases, if you run out of memory, the only way to get the PC back is to shut it off and restart again. Return on again, so you lose everything you work with. So be careful when you define matrices. If the matrix has two dimensions, usually you don't run out of memory. Already with three dimensions, you have to be careful. Okay, so let's give the dimension. And as I said, I don't remember whether I should put 90 first or 365. Let's put 365 first, which I think it is wrong, by the way. But our purpose is to learn through a trial and error, which is OK. And therefore, I got my matrix. How can I check whether the order is correct? The easiest way is to get a river flow 365, which is, which is the observation collected the last day of the first year. Good. Look, to get a value from a vector, I need to give the index of the vector between square parentheses. Okay? Index of vectors, index of matrices need to be given between square parentheses. Okay, now let's get it from the matrix, river flow. Where should I get this? I should get this at 365, comma, 1. Why is that? Why this? Sorry, it's a bigger consideration, but I think it's better to make it here. Let's assume that my dimension that I assume by guess is correct. It means that I have to give, as first dimension, the position of the day into the year, and a second dimension, the number of the year. And therefore, if this is correct, in order to get the last observation of the first year, I have to give 365 comma 1. Because year is second, so year first, day is first, the day is 365. Now, I press return, and if the dimension is correct, I should get 1532, please. But if we are, it's like we are searching the matrix, the, the last number of the first column, right? Yeah, yeah. And so we have to write the flow 2 because we are searching the matrix. Correct. Okay. Correct. Very good. By the way, if I press the here, enter, error, numero di dimensioni errato, sorry, it's Italian, which means wrong number of dimensions. Okay, it seems that it's correct. Okay? 
Let's make another trial. Let's get a river flow 366. And then let's compare it with the river flow 2. 1, 2. Okay, it's correct. By the way, let me let me see what happens if I specify the number of dimensions in a wrong way. So let me clear the screen. Ninety. 365, okay, and let's make again the validation. At this stage I should put 2, 1. You see that they are different, which means that I made a mistake. Uh, sorry? Yeah, but uh, yes, but I, I used the uh, river flow two in the last instruction. Okay, you see there, it's river flow two. But it is uh, the reason it, uh, the, is they are different numbers because I get the wrong dimension. Yeah, it, I have to switch that like I did before, and uh, let's do it again. So the correct dimension is this one. Okay, 365.90, and then I can again make the check, and uh, given that I switch the dimension, I have to switch one with two, it's fine. Good. Now, let, let me go back to the website, because I want to use the same, the same name of the variables. Yeah, it's a flow too, so it, it's fine. Now, what I have to do, what I have to do is to take each of the columns and order them in the sending order. Because I have, remember, I have to compute the yearly for each year the flow duration curve. So I need to look at each of the columns and rank them in the sending order. So let's see what is a possible way to do that. The way in which uh, I suggest to do it uh, is to use a cycle. Actually, I think there is the way for ordering each column of a matrix without a cycle. A cycle is essentially a repetition of orderings, one per each column. So I repeat the same instruction 90 times. I think there is uh, an instruction, an argument of sort, uh, that allows us to tell the program to order each column of a matrix without repeating the same instruction. And uh, I, I don't know, actually, and uh, you, may, you may look for it. I take this opportunity to introduce the cycle, because the cycles are an essential ingredient of programming. Cycles and conditions are essential ingredients of any programming language. The cycle allows us to repeat the same operation how many times uh, as we want. And it's extremely important, because uh, it happens several times uh, in an algorithm, in a computer code, that you have to repeat the same operation. And instead of cutting and pasting, cutting and pasting, cutting and pasting, it's better to write a cycle. So the cycle, as I said, it's a repetition. So let's look at how it's written the cycle. And uh, in this case, let me see, I have to look at the uh, instruction that is below the definition of the array. And uh, look, there is written four, four, four. Round parenthesis, I in 190, which means that you introduce an index, which is called I. So the variable I is associated to the index of the cycle that is incrementally increased by 1 each time the cycle is executed. So this instruction means for any i 
in the interval 190 repeat the instruction below and the instruction below is river flow 2 look at the content included in between the square parentheses I am expecting two dimensions I put only one with a comma it means that the other dimension includes all the numbers in the dimension keep in mind that i is uh, the second index it's varying into the cycle between 1 and 90 the second index is the year so the first time that the cycle is executed i takes the value 1 and therefore the instruction reads river flow 2 comma 1 you don't give the other dimension which means that it takes all the numbers in the other dimension between 1 and 365 it's ordered by sorting the same column so it is taking the whole column of the matrix sorting it and overwriting in this case I decided to overwrite because I want to take two matrices I, I don't want to keep two matrices because matrices occupy many ok decreasing equal to so it's the same sort instruction that I did before but it is applied to each column of the matrix this is the cycle ok let's cut and paste done now we have our 90 flow duration curves and we can plot it but if we want to plot a matrix the instruction is matplot let's see if it works it seems yes this is the result which is precisely what we wanted to obtain of course this is a default uh, a default uh, plot it's very rough colors are decided by the program and there is no title, not anything but you can of course add whatever you want and you can improve it look, I didn't need to rescale the duration because the duration it's just the length of the vector the length of the vector because I split the whole time series in 90 yearly observations so it's already there of course we want to take an average yeah please why the graph is or at least the lines are it seems like done with dots even if in the instruction we wrote the type in equal L. Let me see. Yeah, uh, probably, let me see if we... I don't have um, an answer ready. Let's see what happens if I omit the type equal L. It seems that it's using dots. You see how long it takes. So it seems that it is using dots. Yeah, in this case dots. Because, uh, you know, I think that type equal len, if the, if the line, it means that the type is a line, a dashed line is still a line. So I think this is the reason. And they wanted to make a difference. Okay. There is a way to change these defaults. It's no problem. Okay. So now let's... Uh, print the average here. We need to, to print the average over there because we are interested in the average. Okay, let's take the average and uh, let's look at how it is uh, computed here. How can I compute the average? Remember that I have uh, created a matrix named River Flow 2 where each column is the yearly flow duration curve 
So I have to compute the average over each line because my, my target is for each greater observation of each year, compute the average. So first observation of each year, so first line, compute the average, etc. First of all, I create a vector, a vector called average. Remember that you can define variables by just assigning them. The vector means that the vector doesn't need to be defined. The matrices need to be defined before you use it. Now this is actually a vector, so I could also avoid to define it. So basically what I'm doing is I first define a vector of length 365 because I want to put in this vector 365 averages. So I first define a vector which is filled by zeros and then I replace the zeros with average. And uh, this is something that I always suggest you to do because there are some computer codes, uh, some programming languages that want each variable to be defined, each vector to be defined before using it. And therefore, you know, R doesn't need it. So you could use a vector without defining it, but uh, some, as I said, some languages need uh, a, a priori definition. So I suggest you to avoid uh, misunderstanding, to always define vectors by filling them with zeros before using them. So, now I have to compute the 365 averages. I write a four cycle again. For i in one, I can use the same index because the other cycle is already finished. If you, instead, if you nested cycles, one cycle inside another cycle, you need to use different indexes, like ii instead of i. In this case, the other cycle is already gone, so I can reuse i. For i in 1, 365, I compute the average as mean value of river flow to i comma. When I order the river flow to, I use comma i. In this case, because I'm working on the columns, now I'm working on the lines. So, I comma. Okay. Now, the average is computed. Look, after a cycle, if you type I, you get the last value of the cycle. The index of a cycle is a variable. Perfect. Now we can write a plot with a more refined plot with the average included. Let's look at this instruction. Let's have a look at it. So it's plot duration river flow 1. This is the previous. Uh, this is the previous one. Let me see just one second. What I did here is to write with the instruction plot that you see above there the previously computed flow duration curve. And uh, with the second instruction, lines uh, I am over displaying, over the previous plot, the average curve. This is done in order to make a comparison between the two curves, the one computed with the first solution and the one computed average with the second solution. So let's have a look at the plot. And remember the instruction lines. Lines allows you to put additional series in your plot in the plot that you previously created. Here it is. You see that the two curves are very similar. There are differences. And in particular, remember, the red line 
is the file at a finer detail. The blue line is coarser. And in particular, if you look at the minimum, min, sorry, at the minimum duration, for the blue line is one, because the blue line is the average of the early curves. So you cannot go beyond, below a duration of one. The red car has a minimum duration of 1 divided by 90 and therefore it, it gets closer to 0 and then what you expect is that the river flow is higher for the red car you expect a highest flow that is higher with respect to the blue car because the blue car stops at 1 the red car goes much further goes up to 1 divided by 90. So this is perfectly expected. The fact that uh, you get the blue card that stops at a lower level is perfectly expected. The red card must go above and above because it corresponds to a lower duration. Good. And if you look at the body of the two cards uh, in, in the in the normal regime, let's say, in the usual regime, they are coincident, which is what you expect. And same thing here. The red card goes to a lower river flow because it gets extended to a duration that is... Uh, it's a duration of uh, the lowest in 90, not a duration of the lowest in... in uh, in nine years, not a duration of the lowest in one year. Okay. Now, what it remains to be done, it's uh, to get an estimate of variability. And variability, one way to estimate variability, because so far we displayed only the average of uh, the blue card, is just the average. You remember that a nice advantage of using uh, the second method for estimating the flow duration curve is that you get an estimate of variability. And uh, variability can be estimated by either rejecting. Uh, the upper values and lower values, as I suggested during my lecture, or a more refined way of uh, providing an estimate of variability is to compute for each duration in the range 1, 365, the standard deviation of the values. The average is an indication of a central tendency, what you are expecting. The standard deviation is uh, an estimate of variability. The standard deviation it's defined by this. You can compute, you can estimate the standard deviation in this way. Let's suppose that you have a variable called x, and the x has a dimension includes uh, includes 90 numbers. 90 because x is the real flow corresponding to a given duration. For each duration, for instance, duration 1, I have 90 numbers. So the average value of x is, of course, computed as uh, uh, xi. Uh, we have to introduce an index because, uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a vector that includes, as I said, 90 numbers. So we need to introduce an index xi in order to denote not the vector, but each of the observations in the vector. So, the average is computed in this way. It's a summation of uh, i equal 1 to 90 of xi divided by 90. This is, of course, the average. The standard deviation, which we usually denote with the symbol sigma, is equal to 1 divided n minus 1. So, 1 divided. 89, capital N is the number of years, 
which multiplies xi minus average of x squared everything between everything under square root you may wonder why I'm dividing by n minus 1 instead of n it's just a um, proposed a relationship to estimate it it can be proved with the statistical procedure that the estimate that you get by dividing by n minus 1 is more efficient let me say in an empirical language it's a proof from statistics that we don't want to inspect in detail and in, uh, in R the standard deviation is computed with the function std so this is the standard deviation oops it's not std no it's uh, maybe it's sd ok sd ok so at this stage I need to compute the standard deviation for each of the duration as we said let's go to the website to copy it here it is again I define a vector called standev and then a cycle at this stage everything is ready in order to be plotted Yeah. What the command rep means for? Yeah, correct. Rep means repetition. It creates a vector that contains uh, the first argument, 0, repeated 365 times. Correct. So if I just write repetition 0, 0,3, it's three zeros. while sequence is uh, what we expect and uh, sequence 1, 10 by 2 third argument is the step ok, now we have all the curves, the average and the standard deviation let's plot them all together so this is uh, the plot, let's see, the plot is here and now we need to superimpose average and standard deviation here so let's do it lines, average, lines what I'm doing is I'm superimposing the average with the first instruction lines, average and then I am superimposing other two lines, average plus standard deviation, average minus standard deviation. Okay, let's do that. And here is your result. So basically, you see the average in red, the thick, oops, uh, it, it, I, I assure, I, I tell you it's in red, but you see here it's uh, black. Okay, anyway, it's uh, the average is a thick line in the middle and then plus minus standard deviation. This is a, a usual practice. In order to give an estimate of variability, one puts one displays the average and two more lines, average plus standard deviation, average minus standard deviation. It can be proved that under certain assumption the range uh, average plus minus standard deviation includes about 70% of the observations if you go and count the number of curves that are beyond the blue lines uh, you count about 30 of them this is an empirical, it's a rule of thumb under certain assumptions as I said Okay, and 
and uh, th that's it for this for this uh, exercise. In fact, it's finished. What I suggest to you is, uh, of course, uh, if you use a pre-prepared file, it's easy. But uh, what I suggest to you is to make an attempt to repeat it without using the pre-prepared file to see whether you, you got it. Okay, now there is another thing that I want to show you. Just one second, suggested our file. Let, let me go back to the file. Now, let's suppose that I make a mistake and uh, I quit the program without saving. Okay, so if I restart it, uh, there is nothing or maybe nothing. Yeah, nothing there. And uh, of course, uh, this may be a disaster, you think, but it's not like that because I can easily repeat everything by just doing this. I select the whole file, copy, and that's it. So, of course, you may make this exercise once that you have your suggested R file. You can make it in one second, but it's much better, of course, if you try to rewrite it. Also, there is another thing that I wanted to show you. So, if I save this file, so I go back to my, my website, I could click with the right, I think also in Windows works, and we can save the file downloading it, basically. I put it in my, in my desktop, and it's called flowdurationcard.r. Okay, that's fine. Let me go back to R, and again, I quit without saving, sorry. I restart it, so I have nothing here. Instead of cutting and pasting the file, I could simply write source, which is a function, commas, and I think I push the tab twice, and it gives to me the list of the files in my desktop that start with F. I see that there is flow duration card that hard. <coughs> Close the parenthesis, and uh, it's a way to upload the file without cutting and pasting. This is much more convenient because uh, if you if you source the file, you get in the history of R only one instruction, and the instruction is source. If you instead cut and paste, you get in your history the whole sequence of instructions which makes, uh, which may make your history very messy. So keep in mind this difference. Besides the fact that uh, sourcing a file is generally quicker than cutting and pasting, besides that, keep in mind that uh, there is a difference in uh, the shape of your history. So beware of this difference. You may want the complete history, and then you make a cut and paste. You may want to keep your history clean, and then you source the file. But to, to have to, to do a cut and paste, I have to save before. I mean, I have to copy all my script before. So. By yes, myself. of course. But by, by myself. Yes, you have to select all. In order to make a cut and paste, I can do it very easily here. I open the web page of the suggested R file. I click on. Uh, I have to select all. In order to select all, probably there is a shortcut, but I select all with the right copy. And then I go to the R console. And then with the right paste. This is what I mean if I work by myself on something. Yeah. I have to remember to do this, to copy, to save it on, I don't know, yes, a of text course. file. Yes, of course, in a text file. Yes, you have to do that. 
because uh, the, the program doesn't do it for me. No, not or you may save the history, and when you save the history, you can select your desktop, and the history is a text file. So if you make, if you use save history, it is uh, basically let me let me do this. If you make save history. I don't remember, okay, save history. And I think that if you just do like this, it saves a file in your desktop. Let me see where it is. One second. Okay, it's here. It's an hidden file. In Windows probably it's visible. But if you open it, you see that it's a text file. It's uh, I, I'm not sure in Windows where it goes. You know, I'm not sure of what you have to do in Windows to tell him to put the saved file on the desktop. So in Windows it may be a bit complicated to find out, to find it out. For me, it's easier with the only problem that uh, it creates an hidden file, but it's not really a big problem. Okay, mm. there is one more thing that I wanted to tell you, but I'm not sure whether we have time. Let me see.